So good morning, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining the Mobility Project Voucher Application Phase 2 Walkthrough Webinar. This is the seventh informational webinar in a seven-part series we are hosting to provide guidance on CMO's Mobility Project Voucher uh, two-phase application process. I'm Mateo Henderson here and a part of the program administrative team from CalStart, along with my colleague, Joey Juhas Lakomsky from Shared Use Mobility Center. We both look forward to helping MPV applicants learn more about the second and final phase of the Mobility Project Voucher application process. We are providing this phase two application walkthrough because whether you are applying for set aside or open funding, this application is based on first come first served and we wanna make aware of the support provided, the step-by-step -step process, and how to successfully complete phase two in the event your phase one application has been selected to proceed to the final application process. For this reason, we are here today to provide clear guidance on what to expect. Before we start, I wanna go over some logistics quickly. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the cleanmobilityoptions.org website within two weeks, hopefully sooner. There will be time for verbal questions for five minutes throughout the presentation. We kindly ask that you please make sure to provide your name and your organization prior to answer or asking your question. Also, we ask that all questions remain relevant to the MPV phase uh, two phase application. If you have any, any in-depth questions related to your application or about CMO in general, we also provide ongoing technical assistance that you can access, which we will go over shortly. Again, thank you for joining us today. Before we begin, I'd like to take a poll to see what type of organizations you are representing today. A, community-based organizations, CBOs, nonprofits, tribal governments, government and transit agencies, or others, such as mobility providers. Give it a couple more seconds. All right, let's show those results. Looks like we have uh, a kind of an even distribution of organizations with a focus on nonprofits and government transit agencies and others. So uh, thank you all for attending today. And again, this is the phase two application walkthrough. The CMO Voucher Pilot Program is administered by the California Air Resources Board and the program administrative team, which includes CalSTART, Shared Use Mobility Center, and CivicWell. In this webinar, we will begin with the recap of the program background, goals, types of funding available for those who are not familiar with the CMO program. We will then review the Mobility Project Voucher basic eligibility requirements and the phase two application process with an emphasis in the phase two timeline. We will also provide step-by-step -step guidance to successfully complete the phase two applications, uh, sections one through seven, and then finally provide highlights of what we discussed as well. First, let's start with an overview of the Clean Mobility Options Program and background. The Clean Mobility Options Program aims to help underserved communities start their own clean mobility programs by providing financial and community building support. The Clean Mobility Options Program is part of California Climate Investment, a statewide initiative that puts billions of cap and trade dollars to work, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, strengthening the economy, and improving public health and the environment particularly in underserved communities and California Energy Commission's transportation program. Sources of funding for the program include California Climate Investment Funds, which are generated by greenhouse gas emissions reduction, cap and trade auction proceeds, and the Clean Transportation Program, which is administered by the California Energy Commission, which is investing more than $1 billion to accelerate the deployment of zero emission transportation infrastructure 
and support in-state manufacturing and workforce training and development. This program, the CMO program, was created out of an effort to address barriers to clean transportation access for low income and disadvantaged communities. The goal of this program, the goals of this program are to increase mobility options for low income and disadvantaged communities, provide community driven solutions through statewide while advancing workforce development and clean transportation and expanding zero emission vehicle equity and access without the high cost of ownership. Increase access to clean mobility options that are safe, that are reliable and affordable to communities through California. And improve air quality by reducing greenhouse gas emissions and pollutants. The following are the current clean mobility options service models that in any combination are eligible for funding. They are short term, they are short, short term rentals, checkout membership subscription base, as well as fares for tradi traditional transit and ride on demand services, such as EV car sharing services, bike sharing and scooter sharing available to members on short term rental basis, carpooling and van pooling, innovative transit services like on demand shuttles, vans and buses and micro transit fixed route transit services as well, and ride on demand services similar to those provided by Uber and Lyft. So let's talk what about three, $33 million of CMO funding supports for the two voucher types. First, CMO's community transportation needs assessment, which closed on December 7th, 2022 for the second window, provide has provided three tribal governments and nine general awardees up to $100,000 um, of voucher funding with the tribal set aside of $200,000 for eligible projects for a 12-month term. The total available funding for needs assessment is $1 million. Second, CMO's mobility project voucher is intended to support the planning, development, and implementation of small-scale clean mobility projects throughout the state with a total available funds of $33 million with a maximum of 1.5 million for each mobility project for a five-year term, which includes up to $7.5 million set aside for previous uh, CMO community transportation needs assessment awardees. And in addition, a $33 million set aside for tribal governments a $10 million set aside for current one mobility project voucher awardees and $12.5 million for new MPV awardees. One of our program's main assets is that we offer free full cycle uh, technical assistance throughout the program from pre-application assistance to and through project planning and implementation. CMO's individualized technical assistance has been well utilized and shown to be effective for applicants. In addition to our webinars, technical assistance is offered by email, phone calls, or online form system. We also have weekly office hours and information sessions. We also offer specialized tribal technical assistance and engagement as well. And then lastly, there are tools and guides located on our website to conduct needs assessment, and mobility project vouchers. Our technical assistant team works with you to guide you as you create the best possible project for your community. If you would like to reach us to receive technical assistance, you can do so by submitting an online form to us on our website at cleanmobilityoptions.org backslash help backslash calling the CMO hotline at 626-744 five six seven zero scheduling a virtual in-person information session by emailing us at info at cleanmobilityoptions.org attending one of our office hours which takes place every thursday from 12 p.m to 1 p.m on zoom so tomorrow or check us check out all the webinar recordings on our events page on the um, cmo website under webinar archive section So in this section, we will highlight the mobility project voucher funding and basic eligibility requirements. 
CMO's mobility project vouchers are intended to support the planning, development, and implementation of clean mobility option projects with funding available for a variety of eligible project activities. The main requirement for receiving a mobility project voucher is that you must develop a proposed project based on a community transportation needs assessment and plan and run service for up to five years. CMO is designed to meet the mobility needs that directly benefit California's underserved communities and residents identified in the project area, which is defined as the geographical area where the users live, where the services will operate, and where infrastructure is to be installed. To qualify, the project area served must fall into one of three of these project areas or all of them. It is an SB 535 disadvantaged community located um, in the pink. Um, it is located in an AB 1550 low income community, or it is a tribal land only within SB 535 disadvantaged community or AB 15 low income communities. To note, non-federal tribes may still be eligible if they are in AB 1550 low income communities and or um, disadvantaged communities. To help you navigate eligible project areas, we have provided on the CMO website an interactive map where specific requirements are listed. Now that we reviewed eligible project area, let's move into applicant eligibility. In this program, lead applicants can be public agencies. This means federal, state, or local government entities based in California, such as city, county, metropolitan planning organizations, council of governments, local or regional transit agencies, uh, local air quality management districts, or air pollutant control districts, and public school districts. Nonprofits are also considered any 501 nonprofit organization that has operated for at least one year and is based in California or possesses at least one full-time staff per person, I'm sorry, staff person uh, based primarily in California. Also, nonprofits that are registered and in active good standing with California Secretary of State. Tribal governments include all federally recognized tribes in California listed on the most recent notice of the federal register and other non-federal recognized California tribe governments, including those listed on the California tribal consultation list maintained by the California Native American Heritage Commission. CARB's Clean Mobility Project grantees for new project expansion um, or continuing the existing service with an expansion. And CMO Window One Mobility Project voucher awardees for new projects only. And on the right side, a sub applicant is really an entity that you will partner with to help launch and run a mobility project, which can be a public, private, or nonprofit organization, tribal government, or enti any entity with lead applicant eligibility, which could include organizations that provide clean mobility services, such as a mobility provider, infrastructure equipment and installation, community outreach services, and technical expertise and assistance. Also, the lead applicant may participate as a sub applicant in other applications. I know that was a lot. We will have uh, other uh, time for questions, but we've all kind of uh, been walked through this a couple of times already, but just wanted to provide that highlight. And then just as a reminder, the transportation needs assessment is a requirement in phase one application, which you will submit with the phase one application window opening on March 1st, 2023 at 9 a.m. on a first come first serve basis. Just a reminder, a community a uh, transportation needs assessment is intended to support communities in identifying their transportation gaps and preferred solutions. The project also must be one of the eligible service models that I listed earlier, and applicants must demonstrate that the proposed project is responsive to transportation needs and preferences of the community, and that the transportation solutions were identified through meaningful and broad-based engagement. The community transportation needs assessment components include First, a transportation access data analysis that includes at least one community survey and identifies at least three different community transportation accessibility indicators, such as US EPA walk walkability index. Second, a community engagement with a minimum of two engagement activities. And third, a final summary report. Additionally, we have available on the CMO 
um, website, additional resources such as uh, toolkits on how to engage uh, the community and also some of uh, the final summary reports based off of our window one awardees. So please check that out as well. It's very, very helpful. So with that said, I'll stop right here because I know that was a lot. Again, it's pretty repetitive information over the past couple of webinars. But if anyone has any questions whatsoever relevant to uh, the phase two application for Mobility Project Voucher, now is your time. And again, just remember to um, state your full name and your organization. And we will unmute you. All right, Mateo, looks like we've got a raised hand from <clears throat> Todd Allen. Todd, if you'd like to unmute, then go ahead. Hey, Todd, if you just want to unmute, you're welcome to ask a question. All right, maybe we'll give Todd a second. Um, just keep your hand up if you're still interested in asking a question. Um, moving on, I see Christine. Vitarelli, if you'd like to unmute and go ahead and ask a question. Uh, and can you hear me? Hi, Christine. How are you? Mateo here. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Hope you're um, well. Can you go back to the last the slide before this one, please. Possibly. Sure. There we go. So initially we did a needs assessment. I believe it was in 2019, 2020. And we have now done a supplemental um, survey to expand transit. And so my intent, my, my goal is to combine those two and include it in the needs assessment report. Will that satisfy the requirements? Because um, I'm seeing that you want community survey data and three data sources, which we've already have in our original needs assessment, but we're, we're adding additional um, survey data and outreach to our needs assessment. So is it okay to combine the, the separate um, survey data into one needs assessment? Yes, that's a good question. And, th and thanks for that, Christina. Um, my only question to you is, is it is it uh, focused in the same uh, pro el eligible project area as the, the the needs assessment that you had done prior? It's not it's not an eligible area outside of what you're looking to uh, apply for. So exactly. Well, it's the city of Arvin. We have four census tracks. So OK. Yeah, as long as the census tracts are the same as the, the needs assessment that you had in the past and that those census tracts are the ones that you're applying for um, with the mobility project voucher, then any additional documentation or any additional surveys is a plus to your, your needs assessment. Um, but yes, okay. it, it, it should be totally fine. All right, thank you. Absolutely, thank you, Christina. All right, great. Let's move on to, um, I see Aniv Inc. If you could either change your name to your name or just please just let us know your name and email when you um, ask your question. Uh, hi guys, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, my name is Albert Manukian, organization Aniv, sorry uh, for for the name uh, in the Zoom call. Yeah, so quick question. Um, uh, the one of your kind of subcategories is about the micromobility. Oh, unfortunately, I think you kind of faded out there. Oh, hello? Yeah, so I think yes. the host just muted. Okay, do you hear me now? Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, my question is about, um, uh, you guys have a sub 
category about the micromobility, e-bikes and scooter sharing leg initiatives. Uh, so we are uh, in our city, we are looking forward to do uh, some uh, lending program with e-bikes and scooters, which we are thinking about uh, uh, based on our surveys and uh, uh, programs what we need to initiate. So basically it's more like su subscription lending program model for micromobility to residents, uh, more targeting to low income and the mid income people. So I was just wondering to make a double check and make sure this is, uh, it's included in un under micromobility category or you guys only and solely focusing on the sharing uh, or it's like variation of a sharing is also applicable in the scope of this program. Yes, Joey, would you like to take that question? Um, yeah, maybe you can um, condense a little bit. So you're asking about deploying a um, shared mobility project. Is that right? Or Yeah, it's shared mobility project, uh, but not typical uh, the one. This is a sh a sh bike sharing or e-bike sharing that people can hop on and hop off on the streets, but it's more like subscription-based model that people can uh, get a couple of weeks and own as a low-income and mid-income people. Uh, similar project uh, project was done in uh, Alameda County and also in uh, Denver as well in Colorado. Okay. Uh, but it's more about targeting uh, residents, uh, which is more our uh, priority than just only tourists, which is sometimes it works for sharing solutions. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, shared models are eligible. Um, sort of uh, even sort of atypical, like lending libraries. You know, not the traditional, just kind of hop on, hop off, like you mentioned. But I would, um, it, you know, just to kind of get a, an overview, a further overview and more in depth about project eligibility and eligible areas, which Mateo just, um, just passed over a little bit. I think that there's a more in depth um, sort of reading of all that uh, in the um, recording of the first webinar uh, for the application phase one walkthrough. And that might help you a little bit as far as um, eligible project models, uh, eligible project areas, and then, of course, more about how these projects need to um, come out of uh, community transportation needs assessment. And those recordings are all available on the Clean Mobility Options website. There was a, a link posted in the chat. Uh, thank you. The last link, right? You guys send it events right yeah yeah that's okay. right mm -hmm. thank you yeah and that should be you should be able to find kind of some more answers in there and then of course you know feel free to follow up with uh in the other uh help email for more pointed questions or jump into an office hours tomorrow okay sounds good thank you all right thank you all right next up Let's see, take a question from Sarah Letton. Feel free to unmute and ask a question. And I'm all set, thank you. Is okay. that your, Thanks. no question? Uh, <laughs> okay. Sounds like no question. And then I see uh, Bill Kelly has a hand raised. Feel free to unmute. Yes, hi, this is uh, Bill Kelly. I work for Climate Action Pathways for Schools. And my question was, uh, the phase one uh, applicant application is a first come first serve. And then uh, if you are uh, awarded an opportunity to move into the phase two, my question is, are only those applicants that are funded moving into phase two? So. Um, You'll, will you only select uh, phase two or, or move forward with phase two applications for those that have adequate funding? Yes, so that's a really good question. And uh, I'll highlight that a little bit later as well. And then we also have our um, webinar recording of the phase one application walkthrough and setting expectations webinar. So definitely take a look at those as well. But Basically, you know, um, everyone is, all applicants will uh, apply for phase one. We will, um, it's on a first come first serve basis. Um, and if oversubscribed on the first day, that will trigger a randomization process. And in that randomization process, we will 
um, list the applicants um, according to the fund uh, according to the funds requested until all the funds are exhausted. And then so we'll load that list onto our website. Um, and then you'll notice like the organizations that potentially are um, on the list to um, um, be considered for the phase two application. However, the administrative team does review all the applications for completeness. Um, and we do, uh, uh, we do kind of come back to those applicants uh, for any missing uh, sections or any missing information uh, quickly. And then we'll review those applications. And basically after that, we'll review them. And then we will reach out to those applicants um, that have been selected by the randomization process on a first come first serve to be invited to move on to the final application. And I'll, and I'll cover that a little bit more with some, some visuals as well. Um, and then those, those, those who are applying for the phase, who, those who have been invited to proceed to phase two will complete their application. And then those applications will, um, once reviewed for completeness, will then be awarded, um, be notified of an award. So that's kind of the process. Thank you, Mateo. Absolutely. Thank you for that question. I'm going to take one more question because I do want to move on. Um, but again, as always, we have our office hours tomorrow on Thursdays from 12 to 1. All right. So uh, lastly, um, let's go to Philip Halstead. Hi, thank you so much, Mateo. Um, Absolutely. Nice I, uh, I work with a company, EFO Ventures, we're one of the vendors. And we uh, one thing we've seen a lot of interest in is the question from uh, Monacan regarding e-bike libraries. So we're setting these up. We're hoping to um, you know, apply with some communities for the CMO funds. But a question has come up, and that is some of the communities want to match the e-bike library, which is a form of ride share, with an incentive for those people who go through the library and then like to have like the ability to decrease the cost of an e-bike for them, would the incentive be allowed under CMO? So like an additional incentive to riders through the CMO program uh, right. for so, reduction of fares or for uh, access to the service? Well, no, it would be the the service would be at no cost to the user because it's like a library, e-bike library. So the the funds would be used by CMO for operating the library, purchasing the equipment, uh, you know, for a three year duration, et cetera. But at the same point, some would like to have an incentive, like part of the funds that would help those who are in need to be able to purchase a e-bike. So it'd be like a an additional $1,000 um, rebate, if you will, or um, coupon that they could apply to buy a e-bike if they go through the library. Would CMO funds be appropriate to be used and budgeted for a discount for someone to buy an e-bike? That's a good question. That hasn't been that has not been considered as part of the program as far as the purchasing of e-bikes by the users of the of the the service uh, that you're providing. Um, however, there is some new CARB programs that are incentivizing e-bike the purchase of e-bikes um, that we can send you the link to. Uh, uh, as it's, it's either being developed or is developed. Um, but that would be like an incentive program that is available to any anyone out there to purchase an electric uh, bicycle. But currently the program doesn't um, offer the purchase of vehicles based off of an incentive um, for the service models and the service that is being provided. Okay, that makes sense. If you could send those links, it's Phil Halstead. Um, I can, uh, um, it's Phil Hall. Well, I, Phil, I have, at, yeah, get my email. So I have your okay. email, yeah, and your registration. Phil Halstead, sure. Yes, that'd be okay. great. Thank you. Uh -huh. Absolutely, we'll send that stuff to you. Hey, everyone. I just wanted to add something. Um, thanks for your question. And, um, uh, they they are answered uh, answered uh, completely, but I just want to add something that there will be a public work group about this program 
uh, in March. And I make sure that you receive those information. Uh, as Mateo mentioned, uh, CMO program is not for individual use, either bike or car, but there is an incentive uh, e-bike program that will be launched soon. It was supposed to launch um, a couple months ago. We have the grantee on board. The administrator is on board, but the program hasn't launched yet. Um, Again, there will be a public meeting about that um, in a few weeks, and uh, we make sure that you know and you can attend. Great. Well, thank you, Philip, for your question. We will follow up with you as well. Um, I'm going to move on. Um, and again, we have a uh, time for more questions as well, but I do want everyone to have opportunity to ask more questions and to get a little bit clarity on the phase two application process. So that said, now let's move on the re to the reviewing the mobility project voucher uh, two phase application process with an emphasis in the second phase, uh, which is what we'll be discussing. All right. So as a reminder, the Mobility Project Voucher application is a two-phase application process on a first-come, first-served basis, meaning applications are reviewed, evaluated, and awarded in the order they are received until funds are exhausted. If the number of applications submitted on the first day exceeds the funding amount, it will then trigger a randomization process. This non-competitive application process is intended to lower barriers for clean mobility funding in these underserved communities. So phase one is open for all applicants and consists of basic eligibility that includes, as listed here, a project team profile, a short project narrative, a community transportation needs assessment completed within four years of submission, uh, submission your project area profile, and the total requested voucher amount and additional supporting documents. If anyone has questions or needs assistance with their application as of now, like today, please reach out to us and we can happily answer any of your questions one-on-one -on -one during our office hours or um, you know, provide us some, a date and time and we can uh, connect with you one-on-one -on -one and with your stakeholders uh, to discuss further the application process but it does open on March 1st at 9 a.m. So just wanted to, to remind you all about that. And then secondly, as a reminder, the phase two uh, application is by invitation only, which I kind of highlighted a little bit earlier from the program administrative team to proceed to complete the final section of your application, which we will review. For eligibility, uh, we'll review that section a little bit later. For eligible applicants who have been notified to continue to phase two application submittal, you will need to complete a detailed project narrative and details and update your team profile, submit a project milestone schedule, develop a community outreach plan, gather community resource contributions, and complete a budget worksheet, as well as develop a financial sustainability plan and then lastly, if you had any supporting documents, those are uh, requested at that time too, if applicable. So again, the administrative team, the outreach team, all of us are here to help you. Uh, those who will be invited to move on to the phase two application, we will work with you um, if selected and um, you know, support you as you develop all these uh, required material. So just remember that if you have any questions whatsoever, we are always here to help. As a reminder, the phase two is the final application and the program administrator will notify applicants approved during the phase one of, a, of a phase one of advancement to continue to phase two and submit that final application as I previously mentioned, but just wanted to highlight that one more time. All right, so this is the timeline. So if you have been invited to phase two, what does this timeline look like at the start from completing phase one to being awarded? So as you can see, it kind of starts in midwinter, which is March 1st, and will end in early fall uh, 2023. The MPV phase one window opens on March 1st at 9 a.m., first come, first serve. If oversubscribed, uh, randomization process will be initiated weeks later. 
From there, early in May, the program administrative team will email applicants a notice to proceed to phase two and complete the final application. And then once you have received the invitation, you will begin working on your application and submit at any time up to the deadline around late summer, and we will provide a, a clear date uh, soon. Um, and then once you complete your application by that deadline, we will review and email over a notice of intent to award in early fall. So uh, it's a pretty streamlined process. Um, we do not have all the dates as of now, but you know, there's a, a, a gauge between midwinter and early fall 2023. And again, we will provide those, those confirmed dates a little bit later. Also, uh, please remember that while you are completing your application, either for phase one or phase two, to use the application guide as a tool to successfully complete your application. And also please reference the implementation manual accessible on the CMO website. I find if you have a quick question about your application, the implementation manual is a great resource. I always suggest the control F button for find and use key uh, word searches to help answer your questions. But as always, the CMO team is here to help as well. So in this section, uh, we'll be covering uh, the step-by-step -step process of the phase two application. So let's begin um, with the walkthrough. Uh, similar. Right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Joey. My bad. No, that's cool. Um, all right, let's get to it. Let's actually get to this phase two application overview. Um, once again, my name is Joey Yuhasakumski. I'm with the Shared Use Mobility Center and uh, excited to be here with you all today talking about the second phase of this MPV application. So similar to the first phase, uh, those that are invited to apply and complete phase two of the application will have uh, a couple options to submit the application. There will be the online form, um, which you'll see some screenshots of today. And of course, you're there are also welcome to um, send that in by mail. And there's an address there for that. Um, applications will not be accepted by email. Um, and just so you know, those that are invited will use their application key or unique identifier to access their application throughout this process, um, which includes the foundational work submitted in phase one, and then can begin um, section two. So we'll talk about that more. All right, <clears throat> so first uh, applicants will have to enter their application key provided by the CMO administrator team, which will help to incorporate uh, everything that they've submitted in the first part of the application and allow you to pick up where you left off. And as in phase one, uh, the lead applicant associated with the application key is the party that will, if awarded, enter into a legal agreement with the CMO administrator and will be legally responsible for project implementation and oversight of the entire project team. So, uh, very important, that application key or the, invita the invitation to apply is not transferable um, for phase two of the organization. So you'll be filling out the same primary contact here. So, uh, and what that looks like is just, again, the uh, individual's name, title, and email address and phone number. And that's that. Section two. Uh, addresses um, requirements about the application team and is divided into two sections. There's the project milestone schedule and there's the additional project narrative. So for the milestone schedule, the applicant will have to complete uh, a project milestone schedule. That should include milestones for planning, construction, deployment, operation, um, and reporting as well along with things like um, potentially community engagement activities and, and such. And there will be a template available for that uh, to use on the CMO website. So this project milestone schedule will define key steps in the timeline needed to implement the project and operate the service for a minimum of four years. This project milestone, it's also tied uh, very closely to the reimbursement process. 
So here's a little example of a uh, project milestone schedule. Um, and this is all gonna be available on the CMO website. So no need to uh, squint and write any of this down at the moment. Okay, so then there's the other field there in the section that's called additional narrative in which you can discuss any additional requirements or background uh, related to successfully implementing the project and operating service that maybe you didn't include stuff that's new since you uh, completed phase one of the application. So I'm going to skip this question portion just because we're a little short on time, but when we get through the whole application, we'll, um, we'll have plenty of time, I think, to um, take questions. I just wanna make sure we get through this, so. All right, section three addresses the requirement for support from a community-related, community-based, project-related, community-based organization. You can call that a CDO. Uh, lead applicants must either be a CBO, remember, or they can submit a letter of support for the proposal from a project-related CBO. So to be considered a uh, community-based organization in uh, clean mobility options, a CBO and CMO, the organization should be place-based. Uh, members must reside in the community where the project is located. The organization should have at least one year of providing services in the proposed project area. So it's important now to highlight that tribal governments are exempt from the CBO requirements and public agencies are not considered CBOs. The applicant will have to refer to the criteria we provided in the previous slide to understand if their organization can be considered a CBO under CMO. So continuing with section three, the applicant should respond to the field, illustrate how the statements checked are true with brief examples or details by providing a simple explanation to substantiate the selections in the previous question. Kind of answering, why is this a CBO? Um, and then finally, applicants are uh, making, that are making use, excuse me, of a third party CBO must also provide a letter of commitment from that organization um, in the field letter of support from CBO. So the letter should explain how the CBO meets the minimum definition criteria and how it demonstrates support for the project. There are some great um, templates for those letters of support or commitment that um, will be, or are, I believe are available on the CMO website. So you can use those, um, pass those along to potential um, CBO partners and say, hey, here's what we need, fill it out, give it back to us, and then submit it. And uh, so since we're talking about um, services too, uh, we'll take a quick poll of what type of services um, any of you are planning to deploy. All right, just another second. Okay, great. Um, yeah, we're seeing uh, a nice spread here, pretty evenly car sharing, carpooling, ride on demand, bike share, scooter share, nice. All right, share those results. Okay, let's move on. So in the next section, um, really important to this project, of course, is community engagement. And so in this section, you're going to address the community engagement plan and community resource contributions requirements. So the first field in this section is gonna be the description of outreach plan. And here you're gonna provide a detailed description of the strategy to engage with community residents through outreach and education. A lot of that was done in the needs assessment. 
but we're, we're asking for more, you know, we're asking for your plan to do that as you're actually implementing and setting up your project. So identify key partners, um, their roles in outreach and education about the service and their knowledge and experience within the community. You're gonna to wanna to describe the proposed plan to engage residents during all stages of the project. So include activities to promote and advertise the service, marketing, right? Um, and to conduct outreach to say local businesses about how the service might uh, impact or benefit them. And then of course, to other stakeholders that might be affected by things like um, new construction, right? Or other aspects of the project. Okay, the next part addresses the uh, applicants required community investments in the form of resource contributions, which are prepared to supplement uh, voucher funding. Resource contributions are assets contributed to the project that will support the long-term sustainability in order to meet the five-year voucher agreement term. Resource contributions don't need to be monetary and applicants are not required to like estimate the monetary value of those contributions. Applicants have to provide a list of at least five community resource contributions that are consistent with uh, a list in table three. So where's that? It's in the implementation manual and it starts right at the top of page 41. So um, there's a whole list, but let's talk about some examples of uh, resource contribution types. So these can be things like uh, relationships with CBOs and maybe other CBOs that aren't necessarily um, like the project related ones that we talked about earlier. Um, project related labor costs for planning labor and construction. So someone contributing to that process that's not being paid for by CMO. Uh, project related labor costs during the funding, yeah, but not paid for by CMO. And then uh, materials, assets, technology, and equipment that you already own or maybe have been donated to the project that are gonna be used during the funding term. So if you've already got some, you know, um, charging infrastructure that's gonna be used, you know, for the project that's existent, you know, then that might be a resource contribution. So uh, as always, you're gonna to need to back that up, right? So you'll be asked to upload at least one document to support each of the minimum five community resource contributions that um, were listed in the previous portion. So here are some examples of things that, um, documents that could support those. And again, all of this is in that table in the implementation manual. So let's say you're getting some technology or equipment, um, the uh, potential uh, resource documentation would be like documenting that that's been purchased already. Um, if you're getting an additional funding, say from another state or federal grant uh, or foundation, a resource documentation of that would be something like a grant agreement. Nice. Okay, so now we'll be talking about the budget and financial sustainability section. So this section addresses the budget and then the applicant's plan for ongoing financial sustainability. In the field uh, budget CMO template, please upload your project budget using the CMO template that uh, will be available on the CMO website. Um, as usual with budgets, just we're gonna work with you too, of course, to make sure that the summary total is consistent with the amount requested in that uh, first phase of the application, remember you sort of put a dollar amount to this. Um, the budget must describe the total estimated project costs during the five-year voucher term, itemized by cost components, standard budget stuff. It should be clear and concise and reasonable. And this budget is going to become the basis for future payment requests. All right, again, no need to uh, strain your eyes too much. There will be one of these available uh, on the CMO website, but here's just a quick screenshot of the sample CMO budget. Okay. Next, we're gonna talk about project sustainability. So the applicant must describe how the project can be sustainable after the state funding is spent, that's CMO funding. So in the field, uh, description of plans to sustain the service for at least the five-year voucher agreement term. 
describe plans to ensure the project can be sustainable after state funding is spent. So discuss planned commitments, resources, and our strategies that will carry service operations beyond the four-year service operation requirement through the five-year voucher term. So think about those resource contributions and how they sort of fit into the narrative here. And then optionally, you can kind of discuss what the desired outcome for the service would be after the five-year voucher term as well. And then um, there's a field uh, description of plans to ensure vehicles and equipment continue to serve the community if operations to discontinue after five years. So basically, should your uh, project end, but you've purchased these vehicles, um, how will, or uh, perhaps charging infrastructure, how would those resources funded by CMO continue to benefit the community, um, the target community, right, beyond the five-year voucher agreement term? So you could think of this as like a contingency plan to ensure that those CMO funded resources are best used. Finally, in the field, uh, additional budget and financial sustainability documentation, just provide documentation to validate any plans or expectations described in the previous two fields. So here's a place to just upload more material materials that would supplement um, some of that narrative you've just put in the last previous couple sections. Okay, second to last section, supporting documents. This section is for you to upload additional documents that support your application. So in the field, uh, letters of commitment from each sub applicant and project partner, applicants may choose to submit letters of commitment for sub applicants here. Um, awardees must include a letter of commitment from each sub applicant that expresses their support and commitment to the lead applicant and the proposed project. So each letter must include the sub applicant specific roles and responsibilities in the project. And just as a reminder, we do have some great templates for you available on the CMO website. And then there is an optional additional supporting documents. Um, and here's an opportunity, uh, completely optional to um, add in anything else you just want included uh, in this phase of the application just to, you know, for posterity. And you can skip this if you if you'd like. And then the final section uh, we've kind of seen this before in uh, the phase one walkthrough, right? This is the attestation and signature portion. Basically, the primary contact has to complete the signature fields, sign the document. Um, this does form an agreement. Uh, and just please ensure because of that, that the whole team, including perhaps legal counsel, has read through and agrees to comply with all the requirements for the application and the potential voucher award. And uh, as an additional resource, there will also be uh, an MPV phase two application uh, sample available soon. And then just remember everyone, there will be continued technical assistance, um, just like we've been providing through the first phase, uh, through the second phase to those teams invited to complete phase two of the application. All right. That was a lot, I understand. That was the whole application. Um, so uh, we have a few minutes to take questions and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up. All right, I see a raised hand from Audrey. Hi. Hi. Yeah, Audrey Porcella from Sandag, San Diego Association of Governments. Um, I have two questions. One, you mentioned CBO and then third party CBO, trying to understand the difference between those two. And then the second question being, um, if for some reason between you get selected in phase one, um, and I don't know, whatever happens, like a partner falls out or just all this sort of stuff, I assume you can just politely decline to submit for phase two. Would that be, does that make sense? Yeah, I'll take the second question first. I think that that's, yeah, if, you know, there, after the randomization of uh, the first phase, there will be, I imagine, some sort of waiting list. So if someone does drop out in the second phase, um, you know, th they have the option to do that. 
Um, and here first, I think with the, you know, there's sort of the um, project related CBOs that we talk about that are working in the project area, um, sort of based in that area, and then are providing that required support for the um, project, correct? And then there are other CBOs that might be um, more regional or, or even statewide that are also providing some sort of support, um, if that makes sense. And that second one would be the, the quote unquote third party CBO that you were describing? I believe so, yeah. Okay. That's right, yeah. So just to remember, you know, there is at least the, the lead is either a CBO or there is at least one CBO that's based in that like project area that is um, offering that letter of support. Thank you. Sure. Okay, we got another question here from Priscilla. Hi, Joey. Thank you so much for your presentation. Priscilla Roldan from the San Diego Association of Governments. Just wondering um, how soon will folks be notified as if they're selected for phase two as part of phase one? Like if they submit for phase one and they're selected for, to proceed to, to phase two. Great question. I think we've got a timeline slide to go back to. There, do you want to take this one? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, so basically, once you uh, submit your phase one application, we review it, the randomization list is created and posted. And then sometime in uh, May, early May, we will send an email out to applicants <clears throat> in phase one to proceed to the phase two final application. So it'll be in early May. Um, so the randomization process happens soon after um, the, uh, like a week or two after the phase one, um, uh, the 24 hours has closed. We'll do the randomization list right after that if funds are exhausted. Uh, so give us about a week or so. And then, so that's like, you know, mid-March mid or beginning of March. So you have, you know, March, April, and then the early May is when we uh, have completed the evaluation of those listed in the randomization um, to make sure that their applications are complete, uh, that they're not missing anything, um, and then just some back and forth communication. And then obviously we'll then just send those applicants an invitation to proceed to phase two. Thank you. I think I missed it the first time. Thank you. No worries. Absolutely. Thank you for your question. All good. All good. Good to be clear on that for sure. Okay. Let's give Todd another chance. Um, Can you hear Todd? me? Yes. Hi, I'm Todd Allen with Shuja Electric Bike Company. We're based here in Long Beach, California. Hi, Todd. What's your question? So my first question is if we missed the... Uh, the phase one application, can we still apply? Is it too late? Did we miss a cutoff? Yeah, thank you for your question. That's a good question. Um, only those who um, are have completed a phase one application uh, and had the list has been randomized and the administrative team has reviewed the phase one application, will those applications be moved to phase two? So you're unable to um, apply for the phase two if you have not submitted a phase one application. And really the reason is, is that in the phase one application, we ask for some information in particular, the community transportation needs assessment gap analysis, um, which provides us information on, you know, what, uh, what type of transit services your community needs. And then also in that first application, we identify if the project area is located in an eligible, uh, an eligible project area based off of our requirements. And also, you know, if the lead applicant is eligible as well. So there's, there's a, a plethora of requirements that we sift through in phase one. Uh, to apply to to phase two, to move on to phase two. So there is no applying specifically only for phase two. You have to apply for phase one, be invited to phase two, and then complete your application. So, so my, my question was, are we too late to apply for phase one? 
has, has that deadline? No, fa- I'm sorry. I guess I misunderstood. Uh, phase one opens uh, on March 1st uh, at 9 a.m. So, and it closes on, uh, it closes a month later. So okay. April 5th, so, yeah. So, but the idea okay. is to submit your application as soon as possible within 20, within the first day of uh, March 1st. Okay, great. And, and then it, another question, I'm new to all this. So us being a, a bike shop, are we eligible um, to, to provide vouchers or how, how does that piece of the program work? Or is yes. that an awesome question? Yes. So um, if you're just a bike shop, are you like a, a community-based organization? Are you a nonprofit? Um, we do have requirements for eligible applicants, which if you look at the, the slide deck here, it does provide an overview. But basically, you know, eligible applicants are public agencies, nonprofit organizations, community-based organizations, or and tribal governments. Okay. Um, so if, you're, if you are a business, like a bike business, um, yes. you know, that, that's not necessarily um, a, a, a lead applicant requirement eligible okay. eligible lead applicant but if you're a nonprofit, if you're like a we you know we've had like bike ventura apply for um, a needs assessment in our window one they were a nonprofit uh bike coalition so they were able to be the lead applicant for their their further project but okay. just like a bike shop um is uh is not an eligible applicant okay and and, and th- th- uh, one more question um, what bucket would we fit in if we're looking for some state or government assistance? We have a, a large number of returns. Um, so we would be able to do like educational classes, mentorship, as well as um, once the vouchers are given, we could also provide units for the actual bike riders. So if I'm, can, I'm a little bit unclear on what you're asking, but if you are awarded are you asking if like you're awarded a, 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 a mobility project voucher fund um, and are you able to sell your vehicle or your bicycles? I'm sorry, I was a bit unclear. Um, yeah, I, I got to do a little bit more reading up on what you guys yeah. uh, work. But it, it, what, what bucket would we fit in being an electric bike company? I mean, if you're a, a mobility we, um, partner with yeah. to provide... Yeah. yeah, if you're a mobility provider, like if you provide, you know, bicycles, um, you can be a mobility provider, which it could be a sub applicant, uh, but yeah. the lead applicant could be like, you know, an or- a transit organization, a government organization, and as a mobility provider, providing those, you could be a sub applicant and assist with the, um, with the the vehicles and the uh like the telematics for example or other types of data collection of the services that are uh being uh that are being run but i think if anything what we can do i think maybe what's best is to meet with us on the side maybe at our uh Thursday office hours, and we can kind of sift a little bit more and ask you um, some additional questions to, to grasp a little bit more of what, what you're looking to, uh, to do. And if there is eligibility um, uh, with your uh, organization or your company as a mobility provider. Um, so let, let's, 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 let's meet up uh, tomorrow if possible. Um, we'll send you the link as well. Um, and we can kind of uh, work through that, through Perfect. some of those questions, if that helps you. Great. Thank you so much. Yes, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely, Todd. Thank you for your question. Okay, so I'm not, yeah, all right. Let's move on. Um, just a couple more slides here. Just wanted to highlight a couple more things. You know, one thing is that we, uh, again, are always here to help. Um now that you know we've had time to answer questions, I just wanted to provide a quick overview of what we discussed. You know, one thing is that you know the applications will for phase two applicants will receive a notice to proceed to phase two by early May, uh, 2023. Uh, that is, if you have completed uh, a phase one application, and applications uh, need to be submitted for phase two in early summer 2023. We will provide an exact date for that, obviously. Um, And the uh, requirements for that application phase two is project narrative, project milestone schedule, community outreach plan, community resource contribution, 
completed budget worksheet, a, uh, a developed financial sustainability plan, and then again, any additional documents as applicable. Applicants uh, then will receive a notice to intent to award in early fall. And then here are a list of the webinars. Uh, again, they are available for recording on the CMO website under the events page, under events archive. Uh, we will be posting this webinar uh, tomorrow, or not tomorrow, we will be posting this webinar um, as soon as possible. And then tomorrow we have uh, a tribal government webinar. So if you have any uh, tribal government um, stakeholders, uh, please send um, uh, this information as they might be interested in attending our, our webinar for tomorrow, as we do go over a little bit of the phase one and then obviously the phase two. And then lastly, uh, just wanted to highlight a couple of other CARB uh, funding opportunities. There is the Clean Mobility Investment. It's to increase focus on funding for community transportation needs assessment and planning grants. This is the link there that kind of provides uh, access to all these different types of uh, funding opportunities and programs for clean uh, uh clean transportation in disadvantaged communities. One is the Clean Mobilities in Schools Project, known as CMIS. The other is Sustainable Transportation Equity Project, also known as STEP. And then we have Access Clean California as well, and the, uh, the link there too. We will be following up with everyone, with a, a thank you um, email, and we will include these links as well, as in, in addition to uh, the webinar recording. Uh, it has been posted, uh, this, we this webinar slide deck has been posted as a PDF as well now. So if you do want to access it, that is available. Um, other than that, I just wanted to thank, ev thank thanks everyone for attending. And again, we do have our office hours tomorrow from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Um, and that is every Thursday for the next couple of months until the phase two application is completed. Uh, thank you all very much and have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.